For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. South Africa's favorite author, Kaya Dlanga, is in conversation with Polity about his new book titled, It's the Answers for Me. You wrote this book uh, during lockdown after you, you had lost your brother. It's a very interesting concept for a book. Can you tell us how the idea for it came about? Well, I would say that the idea actually didn't really come about for me, per se. Um, when I kept asking the questions on Instagram, I had a lot of users who just kept saying to me, um, if I could turn this into a book, but I just didn't know how that would work. And so I just did, it didn't make sense to me at the time. There's a guy from Canada who even asked me <laughs> to turn this into a book. Um, and eventually I remember having a, a meeting with my publishers um, and because I'd sent them like an idea that I'd had. And they mentioned this particular concept and they said, well, I mean, what about turning your, your Q&As into, into a book? And, and I was like, yeah, but is it really a book? Because, uh, you know, because I feel like I won't be writing that much. It's going to be a lot more what other people are saying mm -hmm. versus what I'm saying. So is it a book? You know, and I struggled with that a lot, you know, trying to figure out if it's a book and how I would turn it wow. into one as well. And were there specific reasonings uh, for the questions that you were asking your followers? Well, I didn't really have a particularly strong reason to ask the questions because it felt like a lot of people had this urge to confess or to say things that they would not normally say to people. And the reason this seemed like a perfect platform for it was, and I think for me is because a lot of people are locked down and they're stressed and some mm -hmm. people don't have people, someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that, well, let me just ask, you know, some questions that have got to do with relationships because they seem to be the number one topic that people seem to really, really want to talk about. And I found that if I asked a question that maybe demanded a positive response, I found mm -hmm. that I didn't get a lot of people who had anything to say about those things. And that was very interesting to me. Kaya, can you tell us about your confession now where you say you were shouting at ladies who were walking their dogs during the level five uh, <laughs> lockdown? <laughs> tell us about that. We didn't know a lot about the, the virus at the time. You know, the law was very strict and specific, saying that, like, you listen, like, we're not allowed to walk on the streets. We can't be walking on our dogs. Um, the only reason you should be walking on the streets is if you're going to buy food for yourself, you know, or so or buy supplies or medication, you know, that kind of thing. And then I saw this lady walking, you know, <laughs> a dog. <laughs> and she's on the phone and she's walking a dog. And I, I recorded it. And then I was like, hey, ma'am, this is illegal. You can't be walking a dog. <laughs> and I felt like, you know, looking back, I was like, oh, my God, that was so caring of me. Uh, I was such a Karen that day. And that was because we didn't know much about the virus. We were all scared at the time. And, and um, we were learning in real time. And I felt that it was my civic duty, I suppose, to kind of tell people to stop walking their dogs. But also at the same time, I'd seen some people who'd been arrested for walking their dogs. So mm -hmm. I just thought that, well, it's clearly, you know, the law. So why are you doing it? Um, but it's a bit shameful now. What is the <clears throat> one thing you find you can't forgive yourself for? Were you expecting such feedback from the followers when you asked that question? I was expecting a lot of um, introspection because if there's a question, it's a, if it's a question about yourself, then you do expect people to be really mm. introspective. And I think for me, I, mm. I, maybe it didn't really surprise me because when people reflect and think deeply about themselves, a lot of the time we are mostly more disappointed in ourselves than proud of ourselves. Even though we might maybe say in the public platforms on social media that like, I'm the best, I'm amazing, I'm all of this. There's also like a very profound sense of failure and a profound sense, I'm not doing enough, am I enough and all of that. So. I wouldn't say that particularly shocked me, no. Mm -hmm. But then you were shocked, uh, Kaya, to discover that your fellow Kosa brothers are notorious for being heartbreakers. Tell us how the question came about. I asked that question before, long before lockdown. I think that was 2018, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, or 2019. And I suppose what surprised me about it, because I had a, because uh, I saw on social media, there was this mythology around for some men being these heartbreakers and the cheating and all of those things. And the reason it surprised me was because when I first moved to Joburg, because my entire life, I'd spent my entire life in the Cape. So I'd lived in, in the Eastern Cape and then I moved to, you know, to Cape Town. And the predominant culture is Tosa, you know, across both provinces. And so my entire existence was about, you know, Tosa people. And I didn't know much about, you know, other, you know, uh, about other fellow South Africans, like Swanas and Vendors mm-hmm. and Bedis and all of that. And, and we didn't really talk much about them, about other tribes. And mm-hmm. I mean, I also mentioned in the book about how when we were kids, would maybe I remember watching a boxing match and it was like a, a black guy and a white guy, but they were both American and I didn't know who they were. Yeah. And I couldn't speak English at the time. And as a kid, mm-hmm. so we're supporting the cross the Kosa guy from America. And that is, you know, because in our heads, everybody who was black was Tosa, right? And but he happened mm-hmm. to be American. Um and I suppose yeah. in some ways Tosa also meant black and not necessarily the tribe mm-hmm. itself. So when I first moved to mm-hmm. Joburg, I remember, okay. I remember some like my very first weekend in Joburg. I'm going to I, I went to this pub and I'm going to the bathroom and this group of girls mm-hmm. stop me and they're like, "Oh, you look familiar." And I'm like, "Actually, I just moved like three days ago, so there's no way I'm familiar." And 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 no one knew who I was, you know, back then. I was there was no social media and all of that, so it's not like they could have said that. Oh, I know mm-hmm. you from social media, and so. I come back from the bathroom and she says, what is your name? I tell her, she says, I cost her. And then, yes, she says, oh my God, Costa guys are such heartbreakers. They are this. And I was like, what? What do you mean? I'd never heard that my entire life. And so the more time wow. I spent in Joburg, the more I kept hearing these things about, you know, Costa people there, and, you know, Zulu people there. So I was like, it was such news to me. It, it, it never occurred to me that, you know, people mm. would have these perceptions about different groupings of people. And so that's why I asked the question. And I was trying to figure out if it's, a, it's just a social media perspective or it's really true. And I think there's no conclusive response, uh, even though I'd say most people would say that Kosa guys were heartbreakers. And I don't know how much of that has mm-hmm. got to do with the whole mythology around it, the fact that it's been said so much and therefore it's become true because people mm-hmm. mention it so much. And I realized from uh, the answers that many people are dealing with a lot of issues on their own. And you gave them a platform uh, to offload, like anonymously. Do you feel it was a platform that people needed? I think so. I think it's a platform that people really needed because people are are lonely, right? Tremendously lonely, but they don't say it. I mean, I I saw an incredible stat yesterday that kind of shook me to the core. And the stat said South Africa has the second highest suicide rate in the world after Russia, per 100,000 people. So, and Russia was leading mm-hmm. in men, because men, both of them, like men, like commit suicide at incredible rates. But then our women also were pretty high, higher than the Russian women rates committing suicide. And so, and I think if you, if you had to add the two together, so the men and the women, I think, would be ahead of Russia. And that would make us, you know, the leading nation when it comes to suicide. What that tells me is that there is a profound need for people to talk about things, to deal with whatever traumas they're going through. And, and, and I think that the book uh, and the things mm. people are saying in, well, is a very clear indication that we are a traumatized people and, and a traumatized nation. So we traumatize each other. We are traumatized by the environment we find ourselves we mm-hmm. are traumatized by how we grow up and experiences mm-hmm. and and people just don't know how to deal with them and maybe even our rates of alcohol consumption mm-hmm. probably indication again of of these traumas that we're going mm-hmm. through as people you said you enjoyed your parents visits while you were at boarding school and they used to buy you kentucky can you tell us about that yeah so i, I went to boarding school and um i mean it's so funny that like other random things that I, I, I miss. So I was in boarding school and in the Eastern mm-hmm. Cape. And uh, I think, I don't know how often that visit, I think it was maybe once a month or twice a month. I don't, I don't remember. 
And whenever, you know, they came, they'd bring like KFC. So it was always back then, so back then, it was called Kentucky. We'd call it Kentucky and not KFC. And so that was really, really nice. And because, you know, my mom would be there with my aunt because I had my cousins who were also in the school. You, you just didn't see your parents ever. And you were like just with these other kids and you didn't have nice things to eat. The only, th- I mean, we had like every single day, we ate samp and beans. It was just terrible. Wow. And, and we ate, I think meat, we had like, and the meat was like a chicken wing. So it was on, mm-hmm. on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays. Those are the only days we ate meat. Mm-hmm. So it was, so mm-hmm. when we had KFC, so your parents are visiting, mm-hmm. you're having as much of it as you want. So those were nice times. Yeah. And through this book, uh, do you think you have changed the perception of those who associate uh, social media with negativity? Yeah, I think hopefully it does, you know, um, Mm. uh, because I don't think that social media is any more negative than real life or more positive, uh, Mm. any more positive than real life, because it's a reflection of what's happening Mm. in society. And maybe the only difference is that things are a little little bit more heightened on social media because you see it and then Mm. it's captured and then it can be passed on and shared. And therefore, it appears that there's a lot more, but also because the things that you see and you share seem to be happening to other people and not to you. And so that's why it, it looks like it's not something that is... Uh, that may come across, oh my goodness, these people are so negative. And, mm. and, and then you don't think about the negative things that you do and are involved in your daily life. Mm. And which question would you say you got interesting answers from? I think for me, the one that really su- surprised me, it was interesting, was the question was, what have you always wanted to say to your parents but have never been able to mm. say? And for me, the responses there were shocking and surprising because mm. yeah. what I originally, I thought people were going to say, oh, I love you because, you know, I think a lot of people uh, in, well, in black households particularly, um, language like that mm. is not really used, even though you, you know your parents love you, uh, that mm. won't really say, you can feel it and you can see it, but it's never said. Mm. So these are the things that I thought people would say, or oh, like, Thank you for sacrificing so much for me. But what I found when mm-hmm. people were just uh, unbelievably hurt by their parents, mm-hmm. even though they still loved them, they would say things like, I mean, the one said, uh, I mean, people were saying things like, for example, like, mom, I wish you were the one who died instead of, of my dad. Or uh, that when I grow up, I never want to be like you. It's super heartbreaking things that people say about their parents. For me, that was very yeah. surprising and shocking. It was the last thing I expected. Again, that, that made me realize that people are living with trauma and the trauma really starts right from home. And mm. I suppose it explains why we have such a, you know, horrible mental health uh, issues as a country. Someone said uh, it was level four or five lockdown and the child uh, told the visitor that mom has alcohol in the house tell us about that so i think the question there was what is the most awkward thing that's that's happened to you during lockdown and this mm. lady had a uh, she had a, a friend of hers had come to visit and so when the friend arrived mm. i think I, I think that the friend asked if she has alcohol and then before mm. the mom could answer the child basically was like oh mom said that i'm gonna say she does she doesn't have any alcohol, but she's got stuff. <laughs> so that was very funny. And I mean, also at the time, I mean, alcohol is such a commodity. People were, because we couldn't buy it anyway. And if you bought it, like, mm. um, what, what are those people called? They're called, oh, take it or leave it. So you'd have to buy the alcohol, but for an absorbent amount of money. And, and I think that's what... <laughs> <laughs> was happening mm. that time. And lastly, Kaya, you must have learned something from your followers uh, through this book. What do you hope uh, the readers will gain if, if they were to read these uh, questions and answers? You know, I, I think that people would have a more understanding of each other and would become 
a, a lot more empathetic mm -hmm. towards each other because it mm -hmm. uh, people are just going through the most. And again, mm -hmm. I'm saying that because I saw this thing, this statistic yesterday that we have the second highest suicide rate in the world, which I actually think is number mm -hmm. one if mm -hmm. I if they collate them together. It's it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's really scary what people are going through. And I think we just need to be more patient and kinder to each other and not assume that, you know, people are having a hunky dory time. It looks like no one is having mm -hmm. a great time. And I just I mean that's the one thing that I learned. And and, and relationships are just mm -hmm. People are going through some horrible things in relationships. I mean, uh, I have keep mentioning this in different interviews, but one, I don't I remember what the question mm. is now, but one of the most shocking things that I read was how a, a girl called a friend of hers to come over to her house mm. and yeah. she needs help with something. When she gets there, her mom had died. You know, this girl had killed her mother, her own mother. And mm -hmm. then the friend then calls the cops. And when the cops arrive, mm -hmm. she, she lies and she says, no, it's her friend who killed her mother. Because she says she was having an argument with her mom and her mom killed her. And she ended up in jail. And then when the cops investigated, they realized that the daughter had actually killed her own mother. So I just think that, I mean, wow. there were lots of traumatic and hectic things that, that I saw in that mm -hmm. book. But what it the one thing I learned, trauma, trauma, trauma. Even though a lot of the answers seem funny, I think they're funny mm -hmm. because it's so traumatic. There was Kaya Zanga in conversation with Polity about his book titled, It's the Answers for Me.